because I grew things from seeds and from cuttings, for the first year, I watered things religiously and then it's on its own. So in the first year, water, mulch, and then leave it. And most of the things, in fact, all the things haven't been watered for 10 years and they've absolutely thrived. And a, a forest garden or food forest is a, an extremely resilient system, especially in terms of water because of the density of the roots and the canopy, it's flood resistant, it's drought resistant, and pretty much disease resistant because everything's mixed up and not in a monoculture, all in one place. On a hill, near a wood, when nobody goes, up a track, through a gate, the food forest grows with secrets and treasures for everyone's pleasure. And Rob's discover, Rob's discovery. Okay, well, welcome everybody, and um, we're welcoming Rob Handy today from East. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could do that in a minute. <laughs> East Harp Tree, yeah. East Harp Tree, middle of nowhere. Basically, he bought a field or got a field um, a few years ago and has transformed it into a forest garden. Amazing. You've done my introduction for me now. That's... That doesn't say anything. <laughs> but yeah, that, that sums it up. As you can see, he'll uh, quite happily talk about everything. Um, so I'll let him just get on with it, really. Rob Handy. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Go on, All right, thanks. Nice, nice to be here, speaking instead of watching. It's been some brilliant speakers. I may live up to that reputation of having brilliant speakers to this group, but I don't know. Let's see how it goes. As Charlie said, my name is Rob Handy. And I come from the village of East Hartree. It's a traditional farming village on the northern slopes of the Mendip Hills of Lost Centre Direction. Is it that way? Somewhere over there. And it's, <laughs> I've, I've always come from there. My mum's side of the family, in fact, have been there for about 600 years. And my dad's side of the family are all Romany Gypsy sorts. They come from everywhere. And it's a good thing that he turned up when he did to dilute the gene pool because it was getting a bit inbred. And I tried living in Bristol for about six months in my 20s, and it was a bit overstimulating. I didn't like it very much, met some lovely people, and my family was putting pressure on me to, to go down the, the property ladder route and put a deposit on a tiny flat in the big smoke somewhere, like all my friends had done, and seek their fortune somewhere. But I really, really wanted to live in the countryside, yet I couldn't afford to even rent a room in the village where I grew up. But through a series of serendipitous events, I was able to rent some land when I was 28, which is the land I subsequently bought. And I lived on it um, in various things, a yurt and a caravan for a couple of years until I was able to buy it. It's a hectare of land or two and a half acres. And I bought it just before my 30th birthday and planted my first tree, which was an oak on my 30th birthday. And now it's been 10 years, that's giving away my age and it's all mature and all the symbiotic relationships between all the plants and trees are working. But initially I didn't know what to do. I just knew I wanted to live in the countryside, couldn't afford anywhere to live. So lived on the land and the idea of self-sufficiency and agroforestry or forest gardening or whatever term it is, came later when I was given this book for my birthday. You may be familiar with it. It's Martin Fulford's Creating a Forest Garden. And Martin Fulford seems to have the monopoly on forest garden plants. He wrote the book about it and now he sells them all in his online shop called the Agroforestry Research Trust. He's subsequently written more books. There's another really good one. If you have smaller gardens, there's a book he wrote simply called Perennial Vegetables that lists a hundred different types of the perennial vegetables you can grow in the southwest of England, especially tailored for us, which is wonderful. <laughs> I'm not going to use notes generally, but I will read an introduction because they're somebody else's words and they sum it up far better than I could. And I always do this, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of paper. I've read this 227 times. No, 226, this is the 227, but I like to count things, but that's, that's you know there. Um, so if you're sitting comfortably and you're at home on the internet, you couldn't come tonight, picture yourself in a forest where almost everything around you is food. Mature and maturing fruit and nut trees form an open canopy. And if you look carefully, 
you can see fruits swelling on many branches, pears, apples, persimmons, pecans, and chestnuts. Shrubs fill the gaps in the canopy. They bear raspberries, blueberries, currants, hazelnuts, and other lesser known fruits and flowers and other nuts at different times of the year. Assorted native wildflowers, and wild edibles, and herbs and perennial vegetables thickly cover the ground. You use many of these plants for food or for medicine. Some attract beneficial insects, birds, or butterflies. Others act as soil builders or simply help keep out the weeds. And here and there, there are vines climbing on trees and shrubs or arbors with fruit hanging through the foliage, hardy kiwis, grapes, and passion flower fruits. In sunnier glades, large stands of Jerusalem artichokes grow together with groundnut vines. These plants support one another as they store energy in their roots for later harvest and winter storage. Their bright yellow and deep violet flowers enjoy the radiant warmth from the sky. This is an edible forest garden. And I used to say a few years ago, mine doesn't quite look like that yet, but it will in a few years. As I said, this is year 10, and it's the first year I can actually say it does look like that, and it's actually working. It's a very, very low maintenance system of mostly perennial plants. There are, well, I used to boast that there are 440 varieties of edible plants and trees growing, but since getting the geese four years ago, that's now about 280, but I'll come on, I'll come on to the geese later. And for personal reasons, I've actually not been living on site for nearly a year now, but I'm moving back this week. I completely abandoned the garden last August and just left it with zero maintenance. I didn't mean to, but it was a real test of the resilience and low maintenance structure of the garden because it's, I've now come back to it and it's amazing what has survived. Some things have been lost, but other things have absolutely thrived. And as a rule, I mean, grass is the worst thing. It's the worst weed in the garden. Grass is, is ingressed into some of the, well, all of the vegetable beds and pretty much everything above grass height, above knee height has absolutely thrived. So all the, the fruit and nut trees and the shrubs and the, a lot of the medicinal plants and the mushrooms have really taken off and the beehives are doing really well and all the aquatic areas and aquatic vegetables, but really the 70 varieties of perennial vegetable that there were, only about eight of them have survived the grass. But the things that have survived the grass are now the things I'm just gonna leave and let them spread because they clearly, don't need any work at all. One thing of note is the perennial leeks. They are fantastic. They took a lot of coaxing to get them going, but they've sort of become exponential. I had one eight years ago, then I had four the next year, and then they have doubled, and now they take over half the plot, and they're wonderful. They're, um, they're like annual leeks. They're just as big, they're just as flavorful, uh, but they've got a slightly garlicky flavor. And they, they walk around like a lot of the walking onions and walking alliums in a sense that well, like with, with a lot of perennial things, including vegetables, you harvest about a third of them and then leave, leave the other two thirds to regenerate. And as long as you're not greedy, then you can just leave it. And the, the leeks form the normal allium seed head and then the purple flowers turn into bulbs and the weight of those bulbs bend the leek over after it bolts and where it touches the ground, it forms a new patch of leeks and it keeps doing that year after year. So that's, that's how they spread like a lot of the, the walking alliums. But this isn't just about leeks, it's about lots of things. I, if you don't have any questions, I will just keep talking regardless, but, but as, as Charlie said. Is that Babington's leeks? Um, they're not Babington's leeks, although the Babington's leeks do spread that way. The Babington's leeks, they haven't outcompeted the grass, but they've held their own. This is a slightly bigger perennial we, uh, leek, uh, but the Babington's ones have a slightly more delicate flavour and they're a bit smaller. And I do have them growing alongside the bigger leek, which, which Latin name I've forgotten. But um, I wouldn't bother with Babingtons. They are the ones, yes. What did you call them again? Poquaro Petro. Yeah, I'm glad you said it and I didn't have to, but they are the ones, yes. And, in, and incidentally, they're all over the island of Steepholm out in the Severn. There used to be a monastery on, on the island before the First World War when it was used as an outpost and the monks got thrown off. And they had to grow a lot of perennial vegetables on the island because the annual ones were, just weren't hard enough for the, the salty coastal conditions. And when their garden was abandoned, all the perennial vegetables 
crept out and uh, had a hundred years or so to cover the island. One thing being leaks. And when I was there, you're not supposed to touch anything, but I did take, a, I brought a bulb home with me, just a little bulb. And so that's what's taking over my garden now. Um, but you can actually buy them. And in fact, not it's not just Martin Crawford who sells this stuff. I get all my perennial vegetables from a website called incrediblevegetables.co.uk. And it's a lovely couple down on Dartmoor who have an acre of land and they grow everything perennial and they're quite cheap and they send it um, via mail order through the internet. We're hoping to have them come and talk. Ah, oh, you managed to coax them out of their land. <laughs> but we're in communication. Oh, brilliant. They're going to come and do a talk, possibly. <laughs> their site is chaotic to the untrained eye. Um, yeah, as, as my garden looks to the untrained eye. Yes. Um, how we normally start off with this heated moist garden? We were buying an incredible veg, uh, incredible vegetables, and we decided to start our own incredible enterprise store. So we're all buying the veg, and we just we started to sell this. So you've started your own forest garden in Bristol, and now you've started your own enterprise called, what's it, what's it called again? <laughs> Vibrant Veg. I love the alliteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it'll look you up because it, it'd be useful because incredible vegetables, as brilliant as they are, they can't always provide everything. And I'd much rather get things locally if possible. Although I do have all the varieties I need now, but I like to get things for my gardening customers because I, I, there's a lot to talk about. But I should also mention what I do for money. I am a gardener. I, I do gardening in other people's gardens around the Chew Valley amended area three days a week. But since and my unexpected popularity with my own edible food forest or forest garden, I do make some money by doing these talks. And I was going to mention at the end, but I do also do tours of the garden as well. Not very often, but I have a website, which I'm going to mention, seeing as everyone else has mentioned their website. It's, it's called robsfoodforest.site. Robsfoodforest.site. And through that website, you can book a tour. You can find my YouTube videos or Facebook page and all that, all that other stuff. But my but my YouTube channel is called Rob's Discovery, and everything I'm talking about this evening, there is a dedicated video to each individual subject. I think there are about 100 videos now, do with all, all the subjects. Um, the name of the YouTube channel is called Rob's Discovery, but there is a link to that on the website that's called robsfoodforest.site, just to confuse you. It's, it's, all, it's all connected. Or just type in Rob Handy and it'll, it'll come up. Apart from the, um... What else survived apart from the leaks? It's not that the geese don't like the garlic flavour, it's that now the geese have been contained to a certain area of the garden. I, I've always wanted to get geese, but I got them too soon and I let them loose before everything was established. And it only took about two or three days of them not being supervised until they mowed their way through a hundred different varieties of things. I mean, like the, the Swiss chard and the... Yeah, that was established. Why would have because they're excellent guard geese. The geese. Yeah. That's, that's their actual primary function is as guard geese. Because I also have ducks. And I have khaki Campbell ducks, which are the very best slug eaters. They're, they're almost purely carnivorous. And it's said that no one has a slug problem. They have a duck deficiency. <laughs> and you need about... <laughs> There's, they're not always suitable for every garden, although I, I disagree, actually. But you need about six ducks per acre to keep on top of slugs. And even in the winter, when there are no slugs present, they eat the slug eggs from the soil. And they, they don't eat any vegetation until there are no slugs left. And because I have two and a half acres, I have 14 khaki Campbell ducks. Or I did have, but that's, that's another matter. I will have ducks again. And <laughs> um, I will come on to what happened to the ducks. But, um, ducks. ducks. but um, it's, uh, it's because I wasn't living on site for a year and everything just... I wasn't there to protect the animals. I wasn't there to, to put them away, let them out and everything. The yeah, wild animals started moving in and it, it was a fox or, and partly a weasel as well. But it's, it's yeah, it's, but I did keep ducks for seven years without any trouble from foxes because of the geese. And they, they drove the foxes away and, I, and I, I knew they were capable of fighting off a fox because I saw my mum's dog come up sometimes and they, and they, they fought off the dog. But the, the ducks for many years kept on top of the slug problem and I had the geese to protect the ducks from foxes but also the second function of the geese was as grass mowers because there are there is a network of grass paths throughout the site and that's quite important because I don't want to walk on any of the soil to compact it 
so the paths are permanent and the beds are permanent because I'm trying to build up the soil over the years. It's, it's actually happening naturally now with the dead branches that fall and the leaves that fall. The soil is now sort of self-creating so that the forest garden has become a, a self-sustaining system. But just to get things started off before the trees grew, I used lots of wood chip and that, that um, built the soil very well. But then between all those beds and so I don't have to step on any beds to harvest things from the trees, there's a network of grass pads. And I was using a petrol mower and pushing it around, which took about four hours a week. But then since getting the geese, they just walk around mowing the grass pads. And three geese can eat as much as one sheep. And they do a really good job. But as I've already mentioned, they weren't contained exactly. And they started mowing everything else as well. They, they, they picked all the strawberries, they picked all the tomatoes, they ate all the perennial broccoli. And that's why my number of varieties is, is down to uh, only 280. But if I'd waited a couple of years to get the geese, then everything would have been established. And even if they did their best, they couldn't have wiped out everything. So it's because I only had a few of each specimen that they wiped it out. But I, I was too tempted. I went to, to Wells Market with my weekly shopping budget at the time. And I saw these geese for sale in Tinknell's, the farm shop. I saw an advert and I, I came back with these four to lose geese in the boots of my Volkswagen Polo and introduced them to the garden. And they've, they've been happy there since. Um, I also have chickens. The chickens have a different purpose that we may come on to later. But back to the things that have survived the grass. Can I remember what they are? Leeks, yes. <laughs> Lots of ground nuts have done very well. There's tree kale or tree collards, which have done fantastically. I don't know why anyone bothers with annual kale when you can grow perennial kale. It's probably the, the most used thing in the garden. It, you can harvest it in the summer or the winter, although it's a lot tastier in the winter because all the, the sweetness and the sap is in the leaves. It lasts about 20 years. You can grow up from a cutting. I started off with one and now I have 12 of them. And if you do come on a tour, you can have cuttings of all these things I'm, I'm mentioning if, if you want to. So what are you for nettles? Thing in there? How am I for nettles? They do need a little bit of controlling and, that, and the element of maintenance, it, the nettles do come under that. It probably takes... If I really want to stay on top of things, it probably takes half a day a week in this two acre garden just to stay on top of things. And half that time is mowing the paths. But the nettles, I do actually encourage them in certain places, but discourage them in others. And I do eat them because they're a really good protein source. So for example, an egg or a, chick a chicken's egg is about 12% protein. Uh, beef is 16% protein. And nettles are 40% protein, and the white mulberry leaf is the highest protein leaf in the world. A white mulberry leaf is 60% protein, which is why people feed it to silkworms, a white mulberry leaf, which is because silk is pretty much pure protein. And it's mentioned on the archers quite a lot, white mulberry trees, because not only do they produce berries that you can eat, they're beautiful looking trees. And if you, I mean, you can eat the leaves, they're not that delicious. I mean, most of the green stuff isn't delicious, it's what you cook it in, isn't it? Like I, I cook everything in butter to make it delicious, and it's always, it's always the spices and the fats that you cook the green stuff in that makes it, makes it really nice. So white mulberry is quite nice if you sort of wilt it in butter. But if you feed it to any animals you have, be it goats or cows or chickens love it too, it really increases their yield. Uh, chickens lay more eggs, cows produce more milk, and a white mulberry is just a good all-rounder with 60% protein leaves. But nettles have 40% protein in their leaves, so I'm always picking handfuls of them with gloves to put in any any stews or soups that I'm making or just making nettle tea and then having the taking the limp nettles out of the pot and then putting it on toast with cheese or something they're, they're wonderful so I do eat the nettles but their secondary function and like many plants in the forest garden they always have at least two or three functions to make them viable the other function is to harbor ladybirds and I encourage the nettles next to the other things other plants that are particularly prone to aphid attack like um, rhubarb, for example, often gets aphids. So I have uh, nettles growing next to the rhubarb to, to harbour the ladybirds, then come out and eat the aphids. And also roses. Roses have a lot of aphids generally. Dramatic sip of water. So I let nettles grow next to the roses that keep on top of the aphids. And the roses I, I like to grow best are Rosa rugosa because they look after themselves completely and they, they sucker profusely I just strim off most of the suckers, but sometimes I leave them and then they, they, they ate more roses. But they have a really high level of essential oil leaves, petals even. So I, I, they also have the world's biggest rose hips. So like with the, with the elderflowers or elderberries, I've got to now choose in the next couple of weeks whether to pick the elderflowers and make elderflower cordial or whether to wait for the berries later in the summer and make elderberry syrup. So normally I do half and half, pick half the flowers 
and then leave half the flowers for the bees and then wait for the berries and then make syrup. And it's the same with the roses. I pick half the, the petals now and then leave the other half of the flowers to develop into, into rose hips and make syrup. But Are I'm expecting to keep elderflowers. Am I expecting to keep my elderflowers? Mm -hmm. Keep them in the sense of what? Into, into the because they seem to get stripped. What do they get stripped by? Do you know what strips the elderflowers in your garden? Well, Does anyone else know what might be stripping the elderflowers? Something that's obviously happened to the flower. Yeah, it's not me. I mean, it's, it's the sort of thing I would do. Maybe not in your garden. I've, I've got to know the roses are from my office, but I didn't know if that was... At the risk of sounding foolish, I thought that all roses were edible. It's not always tasty, but don't take my word for it. Rosa Rugosa is edible, yes. I thought all roses were, but... Please don't try it unless you find out. Um, but Rosa Rugosa certainly is. Candied rose petals. Candied rose petals, yeah, I've done that before. Just, yeah, they're quite nice. It's quite labour intensive. I didn't mean to say the leaves. I meant to say the petals when I initially said it. I meant to say the rose petals, yes. I've never eaten the leaves. And the hips, yes. Either, either petals or hips. There is oil in the, I said there's oil in the leaves. I meant to say petals. Yeah, I just said, I said the wrong thing. Um, but there is oil in the petals and I extract it the cheating way, and I get a, a jam jar and pack it full of petals and then top it up with a little bit of food grade glycerin and also a really good quality but light, either an olive oil or a rapeseed oil or a vegetable oil and leave it for three months and then strain it off. And the carrier oil has extracted all the rose oil from the petals and you're left with a really nice light fragrant oil. You can either make Turkish delight with or use it as a massage oil or use it for cooking or making cakes and it's, it's really good. Or you can just not do that and wait for the hips. So that's, um, yeah, Rosa Rugosa, my favorite rose bushes, which I let nettles grow next to, to control the aphids. And there are lots of these little guilds of, of plants and flowers and trees growing with all the symbiotic relationships. It's like the three sisters, isn't it, in the annual companion planting with the, with the squashes and beans and sweet corn. And most of you are gardeners, so you, you would know, but for those of you who don't, just to reiterate it, you plant the sweet corn, first and that provides a structure for the beans to climb up and then fix nitrogen that then feeds the sweet corn and also feeds the squashes that then create ground cover and that helps lock in the moisture and keep out the weeds so you get the, the squashes growing up the lower half of the sweet corn the beans growing up the top half and you grow three times as much in one space instead of separating it all out and they all, they all help each other out. Provided you haven't got badgers. <laughs> Provided you haven't got badgers that dig it all up. I should mention badgers and rabbits because before I planted anything, I did spend the first winter time walking around the site and marking out what things were growing there already, which wasn't very much apart from a few meadow flowers and some and lemon balm. And rather than planning it on paper, I'm not really very good with written things or planning things on paper. So I bought, well, I looked through this book and I wrote down 500 of the, of the specimens that I'd like to grow. I bought 500 bamboo canes, um, 1,000 cable ties, two per cane, and 500 T-shaped black labels and a liquid chalk pen. And I wrote out 500 labels and walked around the site and physically stuck a bamboo cane in the ground with a label on where I wanted to plant something and then worked out how tall that tree or that plant would get and what its needs were and where the sun was moving and if it was a like a swampy site, if I was gonna plant like a wetland plant there. And as I walked around, I either typed into the internet on my phone or looked in the book, what is a companion for this? Stuck a label next to it. Then as I found each specimen, either growing it from seed or from a cutting, or sometimes taken from someone's garden if they didn't want it, then I just uh, plant it where the label was. So that's, that's the way I planned it. It's like physically walked around. But during that first winter time as well, I also rabbit proofed the whole site. And I rabbit proofed it with a three foot roll of chicken mesh. I mean, three foot tall. It was very, very long to go around the whole hectare. But rather than doing it the labour intensive way, where I dug a trench and buried the mesh in the ground, I laid it in an L shape. I laid it two foot down and then one foot out towards where the rabbits were coming from. And then after a, after a month or so, the grass just locked it into the ground and it's been there ever since, it's been there for 10, 11 years. And you see the rabbits and the badgers, in fact, they, they get to the wire, they try and dig down, but they can't and they move sideways, they try and dig down, but they can't. And then after a while they give up and you can see the little indentations where they've tried to push through it. But badgers nor rabbits think to step backwards. So because of that L-shaped piece that's coming out, they, 
they just they, they don't don't step backwards and dig under it so that that works you don't have to bury it just lay it on the ground maybe put a, a rock or a log on it so it, it weighs it down and it'll just stay there under the grass so the whole place is rabbit proofed however last year there was a very ambitious kestrel that picked up a rabbit couldn't quite carry it and dropped it over the border it was like biological warfare <laughs> And, and of course, it was a pregnant rabbit. And so now I do have rabbits. And although I don't like killing things, my mum's dog, I do sometimes put the geese away, invite my mum's dog up and just let him go. And he sometimes catches a few and then just shakes them, they're dead. And then he goes off and eats them. He doesn't need to be fed then. So, so now he's staying on top of the rabbit population, which is exploding from, from under the shed. Um, it, it's not such a problem now because things are so well established, but it would have been a huge problem if that had happened in the early years. Rabbits and red wine. Yeah, I, I have had rabbits in the past. I, I don't eat animals now, but I did used to, and I've had everything before I became vegetarian. So I, I do know about the luxuries of, of eating rabbits. Very bony. But it's, uh, I should also mention the duck eggs because the primary function of the ducks is to eat slugs. But also being vegetarian, it's important to get omega oils and duck eggs, as you might know, have omega-3 and omega-6 oils that chicken eggs don't have. So it's, it's really, really useful uh, to have duck eggs. Although it's not always that easy to find the duck eggs because unlike chickens, they just, just plop out of them wherever they are when they're walking around the garden. They don't tend to go back and lay in the nesty box. And speaking of symbiotic relationships, I have a symbiotic relationship between the crows. Is it crows or, um, or rooks? If there's lots of them, it's, it's rooks, isn't it? Anyway, really clever corvids living in a huge ash tree. And I can never find the duck eggs because they just come out of them in the long grass. And the corvids love duck eggs. And there's about a 20 second window of time. <laughs> and the, the rooks always know when the ducks are about to lay an egg and I can see them gather in the tree and they start to swoop. And if I'm at home, I start running across the garden to where the, where the crow is swooping or the rook is swooping. And sometimes, I get there first and I get to collect the duck egg and about half the time the, the clever corvid gets to take away the duck egg so it's and if, if it wasn't for me keeping ducks they wouldn't have the eggs and if it wasn't for them I would never find the eggs so it's a, it's a beautiful relationship and there's always this one that knows me quite well and he always he I, I could swear that he laughs at me when he gets the egg as he, as he flies away it's like a strange sort of cackle and if I get there first I really rub it in his face and like ha he's hopping around my feet sort of <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, uh, lots of wildlife stories. But incidentally, if you want more wildlife stories, there's a video on my YouTube channel called Rob's Discovery called something like 10 Tall Animal Tales from the Forest Garden. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's uh, there with lots of animal stories on. Any more questions at this point? Yes, Charlie. Uh, do you use yellow rabbits going right back to the garden? Uh, do I use yellow rattle? I've not mentioned the meadows yet because half of the site is actually meadow. And so there's only actual one acre of what I would call forest garden. And there's a band around the outside. It's like a, a circle in the middle that's all the, the taller trees. And then there's a band of meadow and then a hedge encircling the whole plot. And the hedge consists of all kinds of edible things at different types of year. It's a mixed native hedge, things like blackthorn and hawthorn and ash and hazel and willow and the sorts of things you'd find in an English hedge, but it's, it's interspersed with 42 different kinds of berry bushes. So although July is the main month for berries, there are, there are berries all throughout the year, like mahonia berries in the winter time, and then choke berries later in the year and buffalo currants quite early. And then, then you've got the typical gooseberries and, and red currants and black currants and, and jostaberries and whortleberries and all those sorts of things in the hedge at different times of the year. But uh, the meadow band between the forest garden and the hedge, there were a few sorts of meadow flowers. But after having introduced yellow rattle, or called hay rattle in Somerset, it it's, um, has an allopathic effect on grass. So it sort of really reduces the grass uh, dominating. And since introducing yellow rattle, 22 different kinds of meadow flowers have just found their way there. I've not had to introduce them. They just, they just popped up. And it's really interesting how, it's, how they found their way. No, no. no I'm, I'm not sure what bacon and eggs is. Um, maybe it's what I call the poached egg plant. I don't know. Oh, it's vetch. Oh, it's vetch. Is that another name for vetch, bacon and eggs? 
Ah, okay, there is, yeah, there is some of that then. Yes, it, that's turned up as well. Uh, but how to describe yellow rattle? Upright stems and tiny yellow flowers. Yeah, upright stems and tiny yellow flowers that come off of that stem. And it's about three inches high, would you say, when it's at its best, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Do the geese eat it? Uh, the geese don't eat it, and I'm glad of that because it's such a useful plant. And also, the reason it's called hay rattle is because when the meadow is due to be cut just after the last flower has finished flowering, which is normally the black knapweed, which ironically is purple, then the hay rattle or yellow rattle goes to seed. And as you walk through the meadow, meadow, meadow it actually starts to rattle. The seeds start to pop with the vibration of your feet from the ground. And that's an indication that it's time to cut the hay. So not only is it really useful for keeping the grass in check, it tells you when it's time to, to side the meadow. And that's probably, even though it's not technically part of the food forest or the forest garden, that's probably the biggest element of maintenance is maintaining the meadow because it's true as soon as you interfere with any natural system, you're responsible for maintaining it. So naturally meadows, you'd have all the, the monogastric herbivores that would come around each year and graze all the herbage and then move on to the next part, you have to artificially remove all that herbage because if you just left it, all the stems would flop over. You get a thatch of dead grass and plants and then over the winter time that would rot down and it would stop things. It would suppress everything coming up next year and after two or three years, meadow would be lost and it would all start turning into, into woodland as the trees uh, took seed there. So because animals don't do that, I have to do it by hand. I tell people that I side the meadow in the summer, but usually I'm either too busy or too lazy and end up strimming it midwinter. But I then have to rake up all that herbage. If I do it early enough, I can make hay from it, but I seldom do. But later in the winter, I just remove up all that sort of rotting herbage and then pile it up on the vegetable beds in the middle of the garden. So I take, so I take all the, uh, the meadow biomass to keep the ground poor because wildflowers love poor ground. The poorer the soil, the better. And then I pile it up in the middle where I want rich ground for the, for, the, for the vegetable beds and for the garden. So again, that keeps it like a closed loop system. So I'm using the biomass that's there to make ground poor, I want wild flowers, to make the ground rich, I want to grow vegetables and trees and things. So good question, Charlie. Yellow rattle, yes, I do have it. <laughs> Can you tell us more about your beds? I'm curious to hear the story. It sounds like you're growing trees and beds as well. Yes, uh, the vegetable beds, yes, I call them vegetable beds, they, there are trees growing in them, and it's it's best to watch some videos or come on a tour, so to see them properly, um, but yes, there are trees, I haven't even talked about the structure of the garden yet, in, in terms of structure, I mean, a forest garden is quite a misleading term, because it conjures up images of, like, gardening in a forest, when it's not like that, it's gardening like a forest, it's just using um, the, the way that nature works and just sort of tailoring it to the benefit of people. But it's, it's quite open side. It's very, very sunny. The canopies of the tree, they're, they're not touching. They're a, they're a huge gap where the sunlight comes down between them. So it, it feels like walking around quite an open, sunny orchard, really. And the only difference is that rather than just standalone trees, there are other trees and shrubs underneath those trees. So if there is a sort of a apple tree here, there'll be an Eliagnus underneath it and then perhaps a currant bush underneath that so that the, the canopies don't touch each other and then perhaps around on the ground there'll be like some different uh, bra perennial brassicas and then some maybe stitchwort covering the ground or some some alpine strawberries. So it's like an orchard that's a lot fuller uh, but there are vegetable beds and the size of them I try and keep them to a size where I don't have to step on them so never really wider than about four feet, so I can get to them from the paths either side without having to step on them and compress the soil. And they, they look like perhaps traditional vegetable beds, but rather than everything being in victory garden rows, it looks quite messy with everything growing together. For example, little patches of annuals growing amongst perennials with a shrub in the middle and a tree coming out. But even though it sounds quite messy, and it is, because of the grass pads, which is my element of control over the garden, if they all look intentional. It's like when you see a pathway mown through a meadow, it all, it looks really neat. And it's like framing a picture, even if it's some terrible abstract art, as soon as you put a nice frame around it, it looks like it's meant to be there. So I, I mow the paths, these beds look wonderful. And the way I created them, it's not Charles Dowding's No Dig Method exactly, it's, it's, it's my variation on it, but I, 
I strimmed whatever whatever grass or I don't like to use the word weeds, but whatever was there, the plants flat. I say strim. I, I, I quite like using the word whippersnipper now, the Australian word for, for strimmer. I think that's the colloquial name, whippersnipper. So I use my whippersnipper or weed whacker, depending where you're from, to, to strim the grass or, and plants flat. And then put brown cardboard down on top or sometimes newspaper. Newspaper is probably better because it rots more quickly and the worms can take it down. And brown cardboard takes a couple of years to completely disintegrate. But brown cardboard, I had a lot of access to it from the local co-op shop. So flatten the grass, brown cardboard, uh, wood chips on top. I mean, compost is the best mulch, but I didn't have any compost and I don't really make my own at the moment. And wood chip is free. And I knew some, some um, friendly tree surgeons that wanted to get rid of it for free. So I used lots of wood chip on top of that brown cardboard. And then some things I planted immediately, as soon as it rained and moistened the wood chips and the cardboard, I just planted straight down through it into the soil and it got going straight away. Or in other places, I waited a year until those wood chips have turned to beautiful soil, all weed free, and then just planted straight into that. And that's still the method I use when I want to either get the grass out of the beds or make new beds. I don't till the soil. I just put more cardboard or paper or whatever biomass I have on top uh, plant straight down through it or wait for it to rot and I know it's really satisfying digging soil but there are loads of weed seeds in there and nature doesn't do bare soil as you might know I'm probably preaching to the choir so you just get weeds straight away and it's much better to build the soil up than it is to just to dig into it yes ah do I put planks around the bed well I would if I could have afforded planks but after having bought the land I should also mention that the whole thing's been done on a budget of practically zero, apart from buying some seeds in packets. I haven't spent any money on anything. So it's all been taken from building sites, as in left over from building sites, not stolen from building sites. <laughs> I feel like several materials. Uh, I'll finish, sorry, I'll finish answering this question, then I'll come to yours. But, um, and I, I, I'm in a position where I can afford proper edges to the beds now. But what I did do is because I'm a gardener, I have access to lots of dead wood. So I put lots of dead branches and logs and things around the outside of the beds to stop the ingress of grass because grass loves to grow across and down, but it doesn't really like to grow up into things very much. So by having slightly raised beds, the grass doesn't like growing up into it unless you leave it for 11 months and then it finds a way. Um, what was your question, sir? Um, I just, I didn't uh, semi-bury the logs. I just put them on the grass and they just stayed there. And that, that was fine. As long as I put the wood chip or compost right to the edge, the grass didn't find its way. Or if it did find its way, as it did sometimes, it's very easy to pull out in, in the loose wood chip. Uh, do, you do, much in the way of watering? Do, you? do I do much in the way of watering? Because I grew things from seeds and from cuttings, for the first year, I watered things religiously, and then it's on its own. So in the first year, water, mulch, and then leave it. And most of the things, in fact, all the things, haven't been watered for 10 years and they've absolutely thrived. And a, a forest garden or food forest is a, a, an extremely resilient system, especially in terms of water, because of the density of the roots and the canopy, it's flood resistant, it's drought resistant, and pretty much disease resistant. because everything's mixed up and not in a monoculture, all in one place. If, for example, a plum tree, because they're not all in a little plum grove, they're dotted throughout the garden, but not too far away so bees can't pollinate them together. If a, a, a plum for example to get a disease it wouldn't then ravage through the rest of it it would stop at that one tree i've gone off on tangents but yes what was your question i wanted to know if you had a particular problem to start with when you were using your whippersnipper whipper snipper you were used stripping ground do you did you have the ground with the you uh, to begin with, it was just an open pasture site that had been grazed by sheep and cows for 200 years. There was nothing but grass there, really. So there were no brambles. And the um, second one, how tall is the oak tree? How tall is the oak tree? That was planted from an acorn 10 years ago, and it's about 15 feet tall now. Whoa. Yeah, so, so a lot of the trees planted from seeds or cuttings. Some of them are, are faster growing than others. And... It's sort of like a wedge shape with the trees gradually increasing in height to the north. So you've got all the lower growing trees at the south and then the really tall trees that are going to be 20, 30, 40 feet tall to the north. Some of the trees are that tall at the north, like the birch trees and the poplars are already nearly their maximum height after 10 years. But the ones at the, and the ones at the south end are their maximum height. But in the middle, there are slower growing nut trees, things like the oak, um, oaks and the walnuts and the sweet chestnuts. 
and they're sort of um, only about 10, 11 feet tall. But it makes a lot more sense growing things from seed. It's, it's almost like false economy buying a, a mature tree because they get a lot better established starting off smaller they, they're slower growing but after about five or six years they take over they overtake the, the the mature trees that you might have bought but yes there are brambles in the hedge and i just leave them be and they're, they're fine i mean i get get blackberries do you have squirrels harvesting the nuts do i have squirrels harvesting the nuts another good question yes i do but they're also a good indicator as when the nuts should be harvested and if I watch, they might strip one hazelnut tree in one day, but there are several others. And as long as I beat the squirrels to it and keep them and then watch, then I then the squirrels let me know when they're ready. They can only do so much. And as long as I it's about a 12 or 24 hour window between when I've got to notice when the squirrels start harvesting and when I've got to harvest the rest. But the, the squirrels have some, I have the rest. Sometimes they take the lot. And sometimes, like seven years ago, the squirrels will bury every single nut on site. But then the mice dig up all the nuts and they store them in my Wellington boots. So that's so the animals do the harvesting for me. So you need to live on site then? I do need to live on site. I do live on site, and that's not something I've talked about at all. And it's 10 to 8, and I've not even talked at all about the fact that I live on site. Um I I yeah, it's a, I think if I were to start again, I'd build some sort of tiny house, but it'd become, become like modular, like to start with I bought I built a a toilet and shower shed and then I had a yurt that was my kitchen and I had a shepherd's hut that was my bedroom so it's like having a whole house but it's quite it's like um, I've got to walk through the garden to the different rooms of the house which is interesting in the winter in my dressing gown sort of going to the shower then to the bedroom and I've got to decide which place to heat they all have little wood burning stoves. So you're on mains water? I'm not on mains water I have three sources of water actually uh, there's on land that's not mine but a short walk away there's a spring that's really good for drinking. That's what I'm drinking this evening. But I've got to go and collect my drinking water. There's a trickle of a spring on site. It takes about two hours to fill up a watering can, but I've got a thousand litre header tank buried in the ground. And that is slightly less quality, less good quality spring water. I've got to boil it before drinking. And I, I bought a testing kit from the internet and I test the water every six weeks to test for heavy metals and nitrates and nitrites. And I keep on top of it. And sometimes, I'm, Nasty things get into it after heavy rain, which is why it's good to have a backup water tank when I've collected the water when it hasn't been raining heavily. And also I have rainwater. I have a, a, a 1200 litre rainwater collection tank. The land is sloping and that's at the very highest point on the site. So I have gravity fed rainwater um, everywhere else on the site. And I use that for showering and for washing and for the ducks and the geese and the chickens and watering the seedlings in the greenhouse. But mostly it's spring water for drinking, rainwater for the animals and for, for watering. And yeah, that's and I, I seldom have to pump the water because it's, as I say, it's gravity fed. And there are solar panels for electric. Again, on my YouTube channel, there's a, there's a video called the Solar Powered Yurt explaining the solar setup. And they don't make quite enough electric as I need in the winter. So I've got to make power choices. I, I often have to choose between listening to the archers or charging my phone and I can't do both. So, but it's fine because I often drive to work. I could charge things up in the car, so it's fine. And I don't need much electric wise, actually, just to, I mean, telephones do everything nowadays. So as long as I can charge my phone and run a refrigerator in the summer, that's, that's, that's fine. Do you have any battery storage? I have battery storage, yes. I have um, each of the little dwellings has the same setup. The shepherd's hut, the yurt, the shower shed. I have 200 watt, 12 volt panels on the roof. And they trickle charge 110 amp hour leisure battery. And then that's stepped up to 240 volts AC with a thousand watt inverter. So I've got effectively mains electric. And yeah, so again, there's a video on how to do that if you're interested on, on my channel, Rob's Discovery. What's your question? Have I had any difficulty with the planning authorities? I haven't had, but because I've been there so long, I don't think I will have now. And also, if anyone did say anything, I can now prove that I'm allowed to be there legally because I, I post been delivered there for 12 years. Most of my income comes from the land. None of the structures or dwellings are permanent. They're all either tents or they're on wheels. And I have livestock and I do tours and YouTube videos and my livelihood is there. Nature abhors a vacuum. Nature, oh, nature abhors a vacuum. 
That's true, isn't it? Yeah, as soon as something moves away, it's like if people shoot, if people, yeah, like people say that they shoot a fox and then more foxes move in, so you can't really get rid of them. Um, and as far as time is concerned, it's five to eight. Are there any internet questions at this point? No. There aren't, okay. Well, in that, which case, I can take more of your questions if you have any. Otherwise, I can speak about something like aquatic vegetables or watercress or, oh, Liz, how do you have a first? I forgot to start the watercress art video from earlier. How do you see the forest garden looking in the next five to 10 years and more relation to the village? That's a good question. How do I see the forest garden looking in the next five to 10 years and my relationship with it? <coughs> it's actually worked in the sense that by the time I was 40, I didn't want to have to do any more hard work on the land. And I just wanted to enjoy the produce and let it mature. And it's worked. It's doing just that. It's got to the stage where I don't have to think about food anymore. I've only got to think about how to harvest it, not really how to grow it. The whole thing's been an experiment, a self-sufficiency experiment. And in terms of that, it's actually worked. Ideally, I'd have someone else living there with me to help harvest things. Because ironically, over the previous years, when I've been working full time, I've had enough food growing to probably feed a family of four. But ironically, I've bought the things that I have growing in supermarkets because I simply didn't have the time to pick or to process it. I mean, it's all very well having it all there, but I've got to find it for a start because things move around. And then things take a lot of harvesting and washing off and processing and, and bottling or fermenting or storing it. It just, it's so time consuming. Farming is, Farming is yeah. It's, um, well, that's basically what you're doing. Yeah, I suppose it is, yeah, agroforestry is a type of farming, but it's um, it's like permanent farming. So now that it's planted, it, it pretty much is taking care of itself apart from the annuals. But yes, all the dealing with the produce is really time consuming. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a joy to do it, and, I, I, and also it's true if things mean more when they take longer, and that applies to everything, be it, be it food or conversations or, or anything, like collecting water from the spring and, and washing potatoes and collecting all the wood for the fire, it sort of means more. So, it, so I, I'm not um, escaping labour altogether, because I still do grow my own firewood, and that needs coppicing every year and then splitting and stacking, but then it's all, it's a joy to do it, and it keeps me fit. So yeah, I, I plan to stay there for the rest of my life. I mean, I like going places, but I always like to come back to the land for long periods and the, the trees will continue to mature. I like to keep spreading the message of, a, of a, an alternative and a different way to live because it's always the question, if you say where you live, people say, oh, rent or mortgage. It's like, well, actually neither of those. No, I've, I've, I've been in the rent trap for a while and managed to get out of it. Let's start the forest tomorrow. What? Three or five things would you start for, for a beginner? If someone was going to start a, a food forest tomorrow, what are the three or five things I'd suggest to begin with? Well, I know that I've got a hectare of land, but you can you can actually start a forest garden or food forest on a lot less land. And in fact, uh, people that came on tours, they said, this is great having all this land, but I've only got a 20 foot by 20 foot town garden. What can I grow? And it is true that when you have more space that you're able to have more species and therefore it's lower maintenance but you can you can you can feed a family on in a very small space but it's just more labor intensive the smaller space it is the more you have to rely on, on annuals which actually you get a lot more value for money you get a lot more yield per square foot with annuals but they're a lot more labor intensive because you have to plant the seeds and then water them and weed them and plant them out and then harvest them which is which is fine but but yeah, you can have a forest garden or food forest in a very small space. And in fact, on page 31 in this book, I bookmarked it in case you want to see. Uh, Martin's, he has written all the things that you can grow in a very small food forest in your back garden and things that will give you a lot of uh, return on your, on your investment. And I actually took a 20 foot by 30 foot section in the center of my forest garden. And I planted 50 varieties of the overall 500 that were growing there as a demonstration of how much you can grow in a small space. And probably about half of what I eat comes from that small space, interestingly enough. But that is quite, as I say, quite labor intensive. It needs a lot of management, whereas the rest of it needs no management. And I've got to forage for things. So, so yes, it would be, it's ideal to have land, but it's amazing what you can grow when you have no or little land, like with container growing. Um, well, rather than naming them, I'll leave the book open on this page and you can come up and photograph it or look at it afterwards. 
but I haven't made a video about that yet. That is the thing I'll make a video about, this demonstration garden. But in the meantime, if you have a mobile telephone, you can just photograph that and just copy it. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, good question. Who's the quote from? Who's the quote from? I wish I could tell you, but if you type into the internet, picture yourself in a forest where almost everything around you in food, it'll come up a hundred times and tell you it's wrong. Ah, uh, what good aquatic vegetables do I grow? Well, 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 I'm glad you asked that. Uh, my main one is watercress. And incidentally, there's a video on my YouTube channel called Rob's Discovery called Grow Your Own Watercress. It's five minutes long. And people think you need to have flowing water to grow watercress, but you don't. You just need water that does not stagnate. For example, my mum grows it in a bucket at the bottom of the downpipe from her guttering. And as long as you top it up every day with a watering can to oxygenate the water, then you can just grow it in water. Tap water is not great because the chlorine tends to kill it. So I don't know why we're drinking it unless you let the chlorine evaporate. But you can grow it in a pond, but you need some sort of aeration system to, to keep the water effectively flowing. But what most people don't realize is that watercress that you buy in a plastic bag from a market or supermarket, it's alive. And if you plop it in water, it starts to grow roots and spreads across the surface. It can be deep water, it can be shallow water. Ideally, the water would be about six inches deep so it can get its roots into the soil, but it doesn't need soil to grow. It will just spread from the minerals and the water and the nitrogen it gets from the air. So no soil required, just water. Watercress, you can grow indoors or outdoors. It's frost resistant. And the more you harvest it, the better it grows. So that's a good one. I like to grow swamp potatoes. They have many names. Swamp potatoes, duck potatoes, because the carnivorous khaki campbells, apart from slugs, love to dive down for these. They're little starchy tubers that grow in the sediment at the bottom of your pond. They're called broadleaf arrowheads. Uh, in North America, they're called catniss. And there are some other names too. But you start off with one tuber. They grow to beyond the level of the... You, you mustn't plant them in water that's more than about half a metre deep, because otherwise they'll never reach the surface and won't be able to photosynthesise. But you, you can grow them in a pond that doesn't have moving water. You can grow them in the same bed as your watercress. They push up through the watercress, so you get a double crop. But as long as you've got some sediment to, to weigh the roots down in, they'll spread. And like I mentioned at the beginning, as long as you don't harvest more than about a third of them, well, you can probably harvest like two thirds with them, actually. And then you stick your hand in the water or your feet if your arms aren't long enough and you disturb the soil. They float to the surface once the once the frost of the autumn has knocked back the foliage and you can eat them raw. Or you can cook them and you use them like you would a sweet potato. And they're like little starchy sweet tubers and they're wonderful. So, yeah, they're called duck potatoes, swamp potatoes, broadleaf arrowheads. And there is a video on my YouTube channel called Swamp Potatoes that tells you everything I just said and a bit more. So yeah, good question about aquatic vegetables. As I'm gonna stay around afterwards so I can speak with you if you have any more questions, but maybe just a final couple before I, before I round things up. Yes, sir. For all the produce that you're harvesting, do you dehydrate them well? Do I dehydrate do you, the produce? Or do you use dehydrated utensils? Or rent this I have dehydrated produce. I haven't done it on an industrial scale as I could have, just because I need help and there's not enough time. I do make electric or a dehydrator because they're only about 40 watts if you get a, um, like a low power one, which runs from the solar system. And it's fine because the time you want to do the dehydrating is still in September, October, when the sun's still strong. So there's still a lot of electric. But the way I've done it is from Ikea. I bought these, I don't know how to describe them. They're for sort of stuffing your underwear in, in a caravan. They're sort of um, like a net shelf that hangs from your hanger. So it's like a, it hangs from your clothes hanging rail. And it's got lots of different netted compartments that you suppose to stuff your clothes in. And then it folds out the way if you don't need it. And it's like a, like a linen mesh. And I just hung that up in the greenhouse and, and laid things out on it and baking trays and just did it, did it that way. Um, and actually on the parcel shelf of my car, I sometimes use my car for driving, but mostly I use it for growing seedlings or for dehydrating things on the parcel shelf. I use it for making phone calls because it's a nice secure environment. And I've also got electric from the 12 volt cigarette lighter. And I use it for drying my washing as well. Can I, can I dehydrate it? 
Dehydrating produce is when you remove the moisture content to dry it out and it makes it last a lot longer. And not it's just dry. Just, just, yes, yeah, just drying things, yes. Uh, mushrooms, I dehydrate mushrooms a lot, slice them thinly and then dehydrate them. If you dehydrate them too fast in an oven, you can cook them. But if you dehydrate them too slowly and then they, they go moldy or they rot. So that's why it's good to have a proper machine because it's difficult to get it right with this, this net, netting affair. I haven't mentioned mushrooms at all, but if no one else has a question, I'll mention mushrooms. But no, what's your question? How resilient do I think my forest garden will be in the face of climate? What do you call it? Do you call it breakdown or change? Breakdown. I've not heard that term used before. That's, that, that's new to me. I suppose I don't know, but I'll find out. But over the last 10 years, the weather has fluctuated hugely. Our winters are a lot well, it's not that they're shorter, but the cold spells are more intense. Like it drops to minus 12, 14 degrees centigrade for a week at a time. But winters are mostly sort of just, just damp and gray and wet. And now the, the, the springtime doesn't start till June. Um, and it's, it's all mixed up. And again, it's some plants have made it, some haven't. But because I've done things on such a, such a scale, it's not that I'm a good gardener. It's just that I planted so much that I've just seen what survives and what does survive, I plant more of that or let it spread. So I've just done, I've used the scattergun approach, plant everything, see what sticks, and the stuff that has over the last 10 years will probably last another 10 years. That's a very convoluted answer to a simple question, but... It's not, it's, I mean, it's not a simple question. It's not a simple question, no. I'm hoping that perennials are more resilient. Perennials are more resilient, yes. You do get more per per square foot in terms of yield with annuals, but perennials are more resilient because they take longer to grow, their roots are deeper, they um, accrue more minerals for the soil, they're better for you because they've taken longer to grow and their roots are deeper. Yeah, I was, I was a great advocate of perennial vegetables and they certainly do have their place, but now I'm, I'm growing a mixture. So the perennial vegetables that I have, I mean, I'm certainly sticking with the trees and shrubs and vines and mushrooms. I'm just sticking to those fabled eight or 10 perennial vegetables that I couldn't remember off the top of my head that I ought to. And I'm, I've got little guilds of annuals now planted amongst all the perennials to protect them in the correct companion planted places. So I'm just, I'm doing it that way now. Maybe the final question, and then I'll say thank you, and then I'll speak with you afterwards, not in front of you. One question, one suggestion. Uh, the suggestion is, if you edit the video, could you add the names of those other eight? Yes, numbers? if if I edit it, then I'll add the names of the the fabled eight at the, at the end, or twelve. I can't remember. <laughs> A few uh, of them. The question was, does the meadow play a role in the forest garden? Does the meadow play a role in the forest garden? Yes, it does. Although perhaps not a symbiotic role. It's more like a, like a sideshow, but a very important one. To start with, it's just beautiful to walk around it. Secondly, I eat the meadow in the form of honey. And I haven't mentioned honeybees at all, but there are 10 hives on site. Not all the hives are full because I take a hands-off approach to beekeeping. Only four or five hives are occupied with a colony of honeybees at any time. But because there are vacant hives, they then move into the empty ones and they sort of move around the garden from year to year. And so half of them are full, half of them are empty. But they seldom have to travel further than the garden for their forage because the meadow flowers are out and that's half of what they eat. And then I don't take all the honey from the hives every year. I take a very... um is an extensive approach rather than intensive, like with all the perennial vegetables. I just take about five or 10% from each of the hives each year and use it like a medicine as, as honey should be. So effectively, I eat the meadow in the form of honey and it's one of the best medicinal things there is. So beauty, medicine, brilliant for pollinators and also for lots of field mice, the grass snakes, uh, since encouraging the meadow, the, the dormouse and field mouse population has taken off which in turn has encouraged the resident tawny owl and a barn owl and other different raptors and things that, that come across and hunt the mice. Uh, it's also a really good source of fodder for the biomass for putting on the bed. So I grow my own biomass, side it, strip it, pile it up on the vegetable beds. There are other reasons that I can't think of at the top of my head, but I hope that answers your question satisfactorily. Thank you very much for your questions and your time. And thank you for asking me here. The YouTube channel again is Rob's Discovery. The website is robsfoodforest.site. 
where you can book a tour and find out many more things. But thank you very much. I'll see some of you in a minute. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to thank you, Rob, on behalf of everyone here because that was a brilliant talk, and I'm sure we've still all got loads of burning questions. And whilst I'm back, it's the 25th of June next tour. Which of course now isn't until September.